Hello, and welcome to our webinar today on why distributed tracing is essential for performance and reliability. We will give everyone a couple of more minutes to join and then we'll kick things off. If you are just joining, I want to welcome you to our webinar today. Um, we'll give everyone a couple more minutes to join and then we'll kick things off. Um, in the meantime, if you have any questions, uh, you can use the Q&A or chat section at the bottom of your screen, and we will get to those at the end of the presentation. And if you're just joining us, welcome to our webinar today. We are giving people a couple more minutes to join and then we'll kick things off. Um, this, this session is being recorded and we will share the recording with everyone who's registered. And uh, we will also be sharing the slides from today. And we'll just give everyone one more minute and then we'll kick things off. During the presentation, if you have any questions, you can add them to the Q&A or the chat section at the bottom of your screen, and we will get to those at the end of the presentation. And we just want to thank everyone for joining us for this webinar today on why distributed tracing is essential for performance and reliability. If you have any questions during the presentation, please use the chat or Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And we'll get to those at the end of the presentation. The session is also recorded and we'll be sharing the recording and the slide deck with everyone who registered. Now I will Hand this off two spoons to kick off the presentation. Great, thanks. Um, let's see, just a second. So yeah, why distributed tracing is essential for performance and reliability. Um, before I get into that, just a quick introduction. Um, so I'm Spoons, I'm the CTO and a co-founder at LightStep. Um, LightStep provides simple observability for deep systems, observability with distributed tracing in its core. And so whether you're responding to a page at 3 a.m. or just trying to understand whether or not your latest deployment was successful, LightStep can help you understand what's happening and get to the root cause quickly. Before I helped found LightStep, I was an engineer at Google where I worked on Google's infrastructure and cloud platform teams. Um, and I also wrote the book on distributed tracing. Um, this just came out this, uh, this spring. So if you can check it out wherever you find books, um, it's got a lot of great things in it, uh, a lot more than I can cover today from the basics of distributed tracing um, to how to think about costs and implementation to a whole bunch of different ways of getting value from tracing um, and what is offered today and what it might offer someday in the future. Okay, so to get started, I just wanted to talk about what changed, right? And specifically what changed in the way we work, um, you know, and how these changes have led to a need for distributed tracing. Um, so many organizations have adopted microservices or other loosely coupled architectures. Um, they're also, you know, adopting some sort of DevOps practices. And these are all great. And I just wanted to kind of talk about a little bit about what that means uh, in terms of the way that we work together. So um, first, there's been a series of technical changes, right? So we move from bare metal to virtual machines to containers. And finally, you know, to something maybe like Kubernetes that provides a layer of um, uh, an orchestration mechanism on top of that. And each of these has provided some new abstractions. Um, those abstractions made it easier in some ways, right? They hid some of the implementation details but they've also introduced some additional complexity, right? Someone on your team still needs to understand what's happening underneath the hood. And there's more ways for these systems to fail, right? Um, 
partly enabled by these new technologies, we've also changed the architectures of our applications, right? So we've moved from monoliths to, um, to microservices, maybe to serverless. Um, these are all ways of decoupling parts of an application into more independent parts. Why do we do that? Well, there's a lot of reasons. The best one, I think, is because it allowed the teams that manage those services to also operate independently, right? So they didn't have to be this giant release that we pushed through QA. Each team has the flexibility to decide when they want to roll out new features, um, when they want to make changes and, and perform optimizations and things like that. Speaking of teams, there's also a lot of organizational changes that we've made recently um, or over the last decade or so. Um, a lot of them kind of falling under the umbrella of DevOps. And DevOps also probably has a lot of definitions. Um, I like to think of the most important part of DevOps is really closing the feedback loop between developers and their users. And those might be you know, the, your end users, the, the folks that are using your app, or it might be just um, other other teams within your engineering organization, right? And by closing that feedback loop, um, we've allowed them to provide more value, right? Like they, they see what those folks are using, they are responsible sort of for end-to-end -end, um, development all the way to the delivery. Um, and you know, once they've delivered it, they take what they learn and they go back and, and, they, and they iterate on that. Um, you know, so together all of these things, both these technical and organizational changes have enabled individual service teams to become a lot more independent and as a result, it's boosted velocity, right? So it's given these teams more autonomy, but at the same time, they've also created some challenges. Um, I kind of think about, if, by stepping back and, and thinking about like a little bit of a bigger picture. So um, in any software system, and actually this goes for a whole bunch of other systems as well, um, you've, got, uh, you've got a kind of a feedback loop of, of sorts, right? On one side, you've got control. Um, and on the other side, uh, I'll talk about in a minute, you've got what you do to observe what's happening, right? So control is really what you do to affect change, right? So this is like, you know, deploying new pods, updating new configurations, um, maybe you're using service mess to do this, you've got some sort of configuration management system. Um, these are all ways that you affect change in your application. Um, and you know, these have gotten a lot of attention. I think it's sort of easy to see why, um, both in terms of innovation and investment within a lot of organizations. Um, and that's really because like you can't, <laughs> you can't go anywhere without the means to affect change, right? So it's sort of um, necessary in some ways, but I think just as important is the other half of this loop, right? Like I said, the ability to observe what's happening. And in a lot of ways this has received um, a lot less attention in terms of, again, how we've innovated and how we've invested. So that's not to say that there aren't tools here, but if you want to think about kind of an analogy to a car, it's like, you know, we've built this amazing car. It's got, you know, a, a really powerful gas pedal, but we never put a speedometer in it, right? So we can go really fast. Obviously that gas pedal is necessary uh, to going somewhere, but we don't have any way of understanding how, how fast we're going. Um, and in software, this has consequences at all sorts of different levels, right? From down at the level of an auto scaling system and, and making sure that we have the data to drive that auto scaling um, to you know, when and how we're doing rollouts and, and deploying new versions of things, all the way up to thinking about you know, whether or not we should build a new service or what the whole application architecture is gonna look like over the next you know, three, six, 12 months. Um, so, you know, like I said, we've increased the velocity, but I think that's come at the cost of an overall understanding of application performance and reliability. Um, and, you know, worse teams often, you know, not only do they not understand it as well as they did before, they don't even know who to go to to learn about that, right? And that's, um, that is a, a problem that's, in, I think, beginning to hold a lot of folks back. Um, so that kind of brings me to the real crux of this. So Kubernetes um, gave every team more control over their individual services, um, but that control is now itself distributed. And DevOps meant that every team um, has responsibility and control of their own service. But now, based on the way that we've built applications, um, every team depends on many other services. And by depending on them, they're also responsible for the performance of those services, right? So if you imagine, you know, you own uh, a service way at the top of the stack, at the top of this pyramid here, and, you know, there's a bad push for one of the services below you, you know, you can't control that, right? You don't have any means to roll that back. But 
you know, that you are going to fail to meet your obligations to your users because of that, right? So you're ultimately responsible for what's happening there. And I should say this applies not just to services, but to infrastructure, to maybe managed services, services that are, that are you know, say it's managed storage that's um, outside of your organization. Um, and what we've done here by um, giving people a narrow control, um, but this wide responsibility, well, we've created sort of the textbook definition of stress, right? That, that is this responsibility without the control. So how do we close that gap, right? How do we um, close the gap between this control and the responsibility for delivering performant software and reliable software, right? Um, so like many problems, um, you know, this is maybe not rocket science, but you know, the solution is going to require having the right data, setting the right goals, and then giving teams ownership um, to actually affect that. Um, and you know, whether we said this at the time or not, distributed tracing was deployed at organizations like Google, um, others like Twitter and, and a lot of other examples as well, to address exactly these kinds of problems. Um, and in fact, distributed tracing is a necessary component to doing so effectively. Um, you can't measure, let alone understand what's happening in your application without distributed tracing. And that's basically what I'm going to talk about for the rest of this presentation. Okay, so how's that going to look? Um, so, uh, you know, we're, <laughs> we're going to start at the beginning. Um, I kind of want to go through some of the fundamentals of distributed tracing. Um, and in particular, I'm going to talk about a key concept, the critical path. Um, and, uh, you know, in some ways this might seem a bit fundamental, but I think it's important to really be clear about what the goals um, that we're trying to um, address, that, that we're trying to achieve with distributed tracing. I'll also talk about a number of use cases, um, including how to improve communication, support other DevOps uh, practices, and ultimately bring performance and reliability back under control. And then um, I'll talk about some concrete first steps that you can take. Um, and part of that is going to be making a plan for how you're going to instrument services. Um, yeah, and hopefully, you know, by the end, we'll um, have found that treasure chest of, uh, you know, that magical, performant, reliable, and, you know, fast-moving um, uh, organization that you're, that you're working to build. Okay. Um, so there's a bunch of different ways of thinking about distributed tracing. You know, one of those is, yes, it's a, it's a tool, right? Like you can Google distributed tracing, you can download one of those things, you can install it. But first of all, like not all of those tools are the same. Um, and so they're not really like a drop in replacements. I know I have a biased opinion here, um, but they, they literally offer different functionality. Um, so I think it's important to step back and think a little bit about the bigger picture about what, again, we're trying to achieve and, and what do we really mean by distributed tracing. Um, so I'm going to start with some pictures because, um, uh, you know, pictures are great. Um, you know, so a lot of these tools will help you visualize traces. Um, I guessing most of you have seen these before. Um, they all have some sort of Gantt charty feel. Um, here's some other examples of, of what traces might look like. Um, and just to focus on one example and, and apologies to those that are, have been, have seen and used distributed tracing tools, but I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, this is a visualization of a single end user request. Um, and in a lot of these user interfaces, there's sort of three, um, three main components. So um, you've got something up at the top here um, that uh, on the top left that shows sort of a summary. It's kind of an upside down flame graph. Um, you've got the trace itself, uh, sort of taking the bulk of the left side of the screen here. Um, each of these bars uh, it represents some um, work done to satisfy this request. I'll talk a bit more about that in a second. Um, colors usually represent different services uh, within an application. And in this graph, like a lot of Gantt charts, you can think of time going from left to right. Um, and as you go from the top to the bottom, you're going down the stack. Um, and then there's a bunch of other metadata that's over here on the right that can tell you more about what's happening. I'll explain a bit more about that in a minute. But what's important here is that a trace is really, um, maybe obviously, an important building block of what we can do um, with distributed tracing, but there's a, a lot of things that we can do that I'm going to talk about. Um, but before I do that, I want to take a little bit of a closer look at that, that building block itself. So um, in words, you know, so distributed tracing, um, it's, a, it's a diagnostic tool, right? It's a way that you observe what's happening in, in your application. Um, and it does that um, in a way that, that describes how a set of services are coordinating to handle individual user requests. Um, and that spans from mobile to browser to backends to databases. So it's an end-to-end -end view of the world. 
Um, and it'll often include other metadata like events or sometimes called logs um, or annotations, um, sometimes called tags. Um, and a, but what's important about this, I was just having a, um, a panel the other day with the other authors of the book. And you know, we were all kind of all talking about our history with distributed tracing and, and how we, we arrived uh, together to, to write this book. Um, and the, the thing that you know, we all kind of talked about it, but it's really the, 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 the idea here, you know, and really like idea on a, on a whiteboard or something like that is about making a request centric view of the application, right? So there's a kind of a pivot here where, you know, we talk about infrastructure, we talk about service um, and looking at, you know, service performance. But tracing is really kind of trying to turn that whole thing on its side and saying, what if we take a user view and see how those user requests flow through the system and, and how the different pieces of it interact. And I should say, you know, obviously as a caveat, there's a lot of other kinds of tracing that are really important, process tracing, kernel tracing. Um, distributed tracing usually talks about what we're doing at the application level. Okay, so um, another way to think about it uh, is a little more concrete. We can think about the data structures um, that, that are involved uh, in distributed tracing. So obviously trace is important. It represents an end-to-end -end request. And usually a trace consists of you know, one or more spans, um, sometimes up to thousands, usually not too many anymore. And a span is, um, this comes from the way that this was built at Google. Um, I think uh, one of my co-founders wrote a whole blog post about this name. Um, you can think of it as the work done by um, an individual service um, or sort of equivalently, it's a, it's a timed event, right? So um, it represents some work, there's some metadata, but it happened at a particular point in time. Um, and like I said, these are usually visualized as these um, bars on a Gantt chart. Um, they have a start that's important, an end. Uh, once you've got a start and an end, you have a duration. <laughs> um, and then there's a service and some name as well, right? So those are kind of the key parts of it. And you know, if I just wrote this out in sort of pseudocode, um, it looks something like this. So at some level, it's actually, it's pretty simple um, in terms of like what it takes to start um, getting the data for distributed tracing. There's not like a super sophisticated model to this or anything, but each of these things, um, you know, there's other models that are a little bit different. If, again, we go through this, some of this in the book about um, different ways of representing the data. This is really derived from the, the Google work on Dapper. Um, and largely that was actually picked not because it was um, the most general, but actually because it was the most, um, directly tied to the value that users could get from the data, right? So you don't, maybe, maybe you know, having a start and an end is over constraining the problem in some way. Um, maybe there's data that we want to represent that doesn't have a start and an end. But understanding that actually, because we're using this for performance analysis actually turned out to be pretty useful. So we built it in as a primitive. Um, you can check out the Dapper paper for kind of more on this. Um, but um, I want to call it the last part here is that there's also a, some sort of a reference to, um, another span to the parent, right? So this is, you can think of the parent as whatever's above it um, in, the, um, in this chart, right? So the, the parent span is the one that, that um, started the work, that spawned the work that, that the child then represents. Um, and what's important about traces that's different than a lot of other kinds of telemetry is that they encode these causal relationships between callers and colleagues, right? Um, so you know that, you know, um, that the, these spans affected th these calls and then that we you know, return some data or, or some status back at the end of those things. And by doing this, we understand where responsibility for this computation begins and ends, and we know how to attribute failures, right? So we know most of the time here, you know, the very top span is actually not responsible for what's happening. It's delegated to the spans below it. Um, and those, you know, that, second, that, that middle yellow span is in turn delegated to two more. Um, I'm not going to say that much more about stuff kind of at this level. Um, and besides our book, I, like I mentioned, um, the Dapper work was sort of um, first popular, popularized this particular sort of style and, and data structure. Um, there's a technical report that Google put out um, like 10 years ago now um, that has a lot more detail about the mechanics of describing and collecting uh, traces. Um, and I think a lot of things have changed in those 10 years in, in terms of how we can analyze and, and use that data. Um, but it's still, I think, a great perspective on deploying, um, deploying distributed tracing in a large organization. Okay, so I talked a bit about um, 
kind of the building blocks in a way, but I want to, you know, um, be super clear. And <laughs> this is another car analogy, so sorry about that. But um, the traces are really the fuel, not the car, right? So distributed traces are basically just these structs, right? Um, but they don't, you know, there's lots of ways that we could use those things. When we talk about distributed tracing, that's really the practice, right? The art and science of deriving value from those things. So if you look at the Dapper paper, actually, some of the most valuable uses were not in looking at individual requests, right? But it's aggregates, right? So for example, um, there was, maybe it's, there still is, there was a weekly map reduced that looked at the entire collection of traces for web search requests, right? Billions and billions and billions of these things. Um, and it detailed how each team, um, each team that was responsible for some part of web search, right? Whether it was searching documents or news or images or videos, how each of those was contributing to overall performance. And then that report could then be, you know, used to prioritize work and a lot of other things, right? So um, again, the, the individual traces, those spans, obviously you got to start with those, but that's really just the, the telemetry, the sort of the raw material um, from which you're going to derive value and actually, you know, build understanding and things like that. So um, we're going to get to a couple of use cases in a minute, um, but I guess, you know, think of the kinds of questions that developers typically want answers to, right? Um, and, you know, I think a lot of what understanding performance and, and reliability is about is understanding change, right? Um, you know, if performance was fine yesterday and it hasn't changed, it's probably fine today too, right? It's because it got worse that you're, you're thinking about it, right? Or maybe it's, you know, slowly gotten worse over the last quarter and now you have to um, think about how to improve it or, you know, you got paged not because everything stayed the same, but because something changed, right? And because traces encode these causal relationships, tracing can explain why those things changed. Okay, so um, so are you looking for uh, in distributed tracing? Are you looking for a request-oriented way of observing software systems? Maybe um, are you looking for a data structure um, to represent that information, a type of telemetry? Maybe you're looking for um, different analyses of those spans and traces, along with maybe logs and metrics to, um, uh, that can help answer questions. Maybe you're looking for solutions to specific use cases based on those analyses. Um, or maybe you're looking for all of the above. And that's kind of what I'd argue for, is that distributed tracing really encompasses all of these things. And like I said, yes, there are, you can think of you know, downloading, installing a tool to do these things. But it's going to take a lot more than just downloading it to actually, you know, solve all of these problems. Okay. Um, the next part, I think, one of the key concepts and, and core to many of those analyses is this this concept called the critical path. Um, and again, maybe some of you have heard this before. I just kind of want to like go through it and understand what's going on here. This is really, I think, um, if you want to think of this from a project management or a resource management point of view, this is really about making the right choices, right? Making, understanding what matters and then addressing those problems, right? Because there's gonna be a lot of things that are slow. There's gonna be a lot of things that'll fail. I'll probably say that a lot in this talk. A lot of things will fail in a distributed system. Not all of those matter. Um, and a critical path is a way for you, a tool for you to understand that. Okay, looking at this trace again, um, uh, a span is part of the critical path if reducing its dur duration speeds up the overall request, right? So you can think of it just like in project management, it's important to understand the long pole. Um, and so in kind of in this example here, there's a portion of, um, of this yellow span, a, a portion of the work that's represented by the yellow span, where that service is waiting for the blue one to do something. And that means at that moment in time, the blue one is on the critical path. Now, there's a few subtleties to this because like in this example, like, you know, for, uh, you know, for the first part of the blue request is the blue on the critical path or the green one, um, you know, different, you, there's sort of a little bit of art to picking what's going on here. But really the point is like, um, I mean, there's a kind of operational view of things, but you know, the critical path is the part that you speed up to make the overall thing faster, right? Um, and from there you can decide sort of what portion of the overall request duration each span or service is responsible for. And then you can step back even further, right? You can take a set of traces and you can ask the same question. So how does each service contribute on average to the critical path? And this is exactly what was done in this analysis of, of, of web search results at, at Google. It was saying for all of the examples we have of requests, all the billions and billions of examples, let's look at the critical path of each one of those things, figure out which services contribute to those and how we can improve that. Um, 
there's another kind of name for this thing. It's actually used in a bunch of parallel computation uh, and performance analysis called Amdahl's law. Um, you can also use it in a, in a distributed system as well. It basically says when you're optimizing part of a process, right? if you're going to pick to optimize A or optimize B, you'll get the biggest benefit from optimizing the biggest part. I guess kind of obvious in a way, but um, you can actually quantify some of, of the effects of that choice. It also sets an upper bound on how good things can get. Right. So, um, you know, given a choice here between trying to improve uh, A or trying to improve B, imagine sort of the width here is the time um, that each of these represents. Um, you know, if we speed up um, A by 50%, we get something that looks like this. If we speed up B by 50%, we get something that looks like this. So, obviously, um, like A is, or excuse me, B is a better choice. Amdahl also says because A only takes up about 15% of the overall request duration, the overall critical path. Um, there's no improvement in A that will ever improve overall performance by more than 15%, right? So it may be obvious, but like once you have the data, um, that's kind of the key part. So, um, you know, and I, like I said, we saw, you know, we did this analysis at Google and we saw teams who didn't look at that analysis, right? They would go and spend weeks or months doing optimization work. And while they dramatically improved the performance of their individual services, because those services were not on the critical path, that had no impact on the end user perceived performance. So it was a waste of time, right? I mean, they could have been doing other things, building new features, making things more reliable, going on vacation, who knows what, right? Um, so understanding critical paths is really important for prioritizing um, engineering work. Um, just to take an example of a, of a real trace. Um, so, you know, here we might think, you know, should we be optimizing for the authorization step or looking at the payment processing? Um, again, um, you know, there's, there's no way that improving uh, the, the, the authorization step is going to have a significant impact. It only took, you know, in this case, 42 milliseconds, and the overall request took almost three seconds, it looks like. Um, and I think one of the things that's under, important to understand is that, um, you know, critical path you can think of as this very sort of continuous thing. Each service is contributing some percentage to that. But you can also have these very discrete shifts, right? So. What if in a release, um, a service went from not being on the critical path at all to suddenly being on the critical path, right? That means that any future changes are suddenly going to have a much bigger impact. So maybe that team was kind of operating under the assumption that, you know, performance is no big deal. Like we're not going to have a big effect on what users perceived. When that release happened, that changed in a very binary way. And so understanding what the pieces are and how they change is, is really important and, and should affect how we're thinking about the planning. Sort of a side note on this, thinking about failures, right? So I, I've been talking a lot about, about the duration, about how long, it, how long it takes to satisfy these requests. Um, critical path can also help us um, think a little bit about errors, not directly, but like if we use the same line of reasoning, right? And, and like I mentioned, there's always things um, failing in a distributed system. But as in the case for optimizations, like do those really matter, right? And you should be asking, just like for performance, do those failures matter to your end users? Um, there's one simple rule you can use, which is, you know, does the error propagate up the stack or not? Um, but like for the critical path, it's important to understand what's happening around the, fail the failure. Um, and distributed tracing, like um, in helping to understand the critical path, puts context around those failures so you can understand what's happening. Okay, so a critical path is, is literally <laughs> critical to understand, um, you know, and this is at, at many different scales, right? Um, again, whether or not you're thinking about like, was this a good release or not? Or if you're planning out, um, you know, work over the next couple of quarters, right? Are, should you be prioritizing new features or reducing costs? Um, maybe you know that you need to reduce costs. Where's the best place to do that? Um, and like I said, um, even on a small scale where you're thinking about responding to a page, like focusing on things on the critical path, things where errors are propagating up the stack, like those are going to be the things that, you know, hopefully you're paging on, on symptoms, right? You're paging on things that your users can perceive. Um, and so tracing will make sure that you're looking at parts of the application that are actually affecting what users are perceiving. Um, so, okay, cool. So I want to get a little more concrete now and talk about some specific use cases. Um, that I think thinking about like kind of day-to-day -day work of, uh, of a developer and how they can use distributed tracing to do that. So first one of those is understanding dependencies. Um, and I first just want to paint a picture of what that looks like without tracing. So um, here's this kind of simple system diagram. A lot of tools will 
we'll draw these for you. But without tracing, I think the thing it's important to realize is what they're really showing you looks a little more like this, right? They're showing you sort of pairwise connections between these things. Um, they're not necessarily telling you about the complete picture. They're just kind of taking a shortcut and, and kind of, you know, um, combining these different pieces just to make it look prettier. So the kind of the question I think we really should be thinking about is, you know, a lot of system diagrams can show you, for example, hey, you've got a spike in errors between service D and service E. Maybe that's up at 8%, right? Okay, that's a, that's, that's a problem, I think, anyway. I mean, maybe I should first figure out whether that's affecting my end users or not. Um, but assuming it is, you know, maybe I want to ask questions about what's going on. You know, maybe at the same time, I can look at a diagram like this and it's telling me that the request rate between service B and service D is up by 4% at the same time. That might be related, I don't know. I don't know if those additional requests that are, you know, out of the norm are the ones that are having errors or not. Um, it might be something actually over on the side as well, right? I, there can be other things that are changing. So maybe the average response size between B and C has also gone up at the same time. Are those on requests that also go through D and E? I don't know, right? Like, it's not something that this diagram can actually tell me. Um, so again, without tracing, what we're really talking about with a, a system diagram like this is that we're considering each connection in isolation, right? We're saying, you know, A talks to B, B talks to D. We're not really saying whether or not uh, those requests that come from A necessarily go to D or, dot, D or not, right? Um, usually there's no way to narrow scope in this. Um, so for example, like um, maybe I'm only interested in, in requests throughout the application where there's an error between D and E. That would be really useful because then I could start to see, you know, what are the changes? How does that affect some of the other metrics that I'm looking at? And ideally, you know, the, 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 the tool would actually be telling me something about these metrics itself, right? So it just stand in contrast, like with tracing, um, you know, it's end-to-end -end context, right? It's a graph, not just a set of pairs of services that are talking. Um, I can refine that graph based upon any property of the request, right? So now I can say, show me all the requests um, that pass through A, but also pass through E, or maybe that pass through A and, and have an error in E, right? Because now I can determine whether or not that those errors are actually having impact. And, you know, I want the metrics that I'm looking at in a graph like this to be tied to that scope, right? So once I've narrowed down to end-to-end -to -end requests that have an error in E, tell me about the request sides from the other services. Does that request size actually correlate with those errors or is it just something that's changing across the application as a whole? And the thing, you know, the, the differences here is really kind of about information overload in a sense, right? Like if you're just talking about the connections between pairs of services, like tons of services are gonna connect to each other. That's not necessarily relevant to the problem you're trying to solve. Um, if you don't have a way of reducing scope, like as your organization, as your application grows, it's just gonna make answering these questions harder and harder. And eventually you're gonna end up with something like the, the Netflix uh, sort of Death Star diagram here, where it just seems like everything's talking to everything else. And you know, there's gonna be lots of failures here that have impact, or maybe those are not actually causal, maybe they're just um, interrelated in some way. But um, really, again, thinking about tracing as a way to pare down this data is really important. Okay, um, next use case. Root cause analysis. So root cause analysis is a thing that developers are doing all the time, especially in DevOps, uh, DevOps practice, because again, they're responsible for delivering software. Um, and like I mentioned, understanding what change, change is really important, right? So can um, distributed tracing help? Well, one thing is it can kind of put that change in context, right? So let's compare these two, um, two sets of requests, right? So let's consider first, um, you know, requests that have happened maybe in the last couple of hours where there seem to be a fair number of errors with requests that happened before this. And this is actually an example I'm taking from Lightstep's own monitoring system. So um, Crouton, uh, the Crouton service here is one of our internal services that we use as part of the implementation of our product. Um, we had a regression in terms of uh, errors that we saw and engineers are asking what changed, right? Um, so we can take the traces that we see um, here that happened kind of on the red side of things, take the traces that happen on the blue side of things, and then we can look um, across all of the different data in those things, whether that be um, uh, you know, latency, error rates, um, or even things like logs and tags that are associated with those things and try and understand um, how, can those, how can that data explain what happened, right? So you know, one of the things that we actually found in this case is that looking at logs in a different service here. So these were logs that were found in the live view service, still part of the same end-to-end -end request. Um, 
So again, croutons having errors, see some new logs that hadn't occurred before in live view, right? So what we're looking at here is that these logs occurred many times uh, in the, the regression set of, of traces and never occurred in the baseline set. Um, so that's a strong indicator that there might be a causal relationship here. And indeed, like we can go and look at these individual traces now and say, um, you know, this uh, looks like some sort of encoding error here, right? Um, and that encoding error maybe is being propagated back up. Um, note that I never really had to look at, um, at Crouton's logs, because it turns out it wasn't Crouton's fault, right? It was LiveView's fault. Um, and I didn't have to know that it was LiveView's fault in advance, right? Like we're looking across the entire system to understand that. Okay, another example, um, making alerts more actionable. Um, so, you know, the way we use PagerDuty is we've obviously integrated it with LightStep. Um, and when we get paged, uh, in this case, uh, it looks like there's a, a latency bump, we get uh, an example of, of what's going wrong, right? So we have um, sort of evidence immediately for, hey, it looks like P50 latency has spiked. Show me an example of where that's happening. Uh, and indeed, like I, you know, if I got that page, I can wake up, open up the keyboard, click on that link, and I've immediately got this example. And I can see, you know, looking at the critical path here, um, it looks like the log analysis is actually the thing that's slowing things down here. Um, it's actually, there's a bunch of parallelism that's happening in this example, and it looks pretty unbalanced um, in that, you know, some of the batches are only taking, it looks like on the order of hundreds of milliseconds. Um, and this one particular slow one is taking almost two seconds. So maybe there's a bug in how we're doing that batching. Um, maybe there's some other problem. But now I know exactly where in the code to go look. Um, we've also seen um, folks using distributed tracing to actually change the way alerts are delivered. Um, so using information in the trace to say, you know, this alert was actually um, maybe created by the team that owns service A. But we're pretty confident looking at the traces that the problem is in service B. So I'm just gonna skip the part where I wake up anyone on service A and just go right to service B um, because I can make a pretty strong guess, the software can make a pretty so strong guess that, um, that service A is actually not gonna do anything but just turn around and, and page that other team. So let's just skip right to it. Um, and thinking about how teams interact is also really kind of important in this. I, I grabbed this um, from, um, from one of our, uh, one of LightSteps customers and it's, kind of a boring trace in a lot of ways. The, the thing I want to call out here is that um, the span at the top here comes from an iOS client, from, probably from somebody's phone, right? And that request um, from its measurement of this, this network request took 1.6 seconds. If you look at what the back end is saying, right? This is um, basically like what the, the proxy, the server side proxy is saying. Um, from its point of view, this request took 31 milliseconds, right? Um, and what we saw over and over again at Google is that tracing was really important in bringing these two teams together to agree objectively on the facts, on the objective facts about what happened, right? Because if you are solely looking at, say, the metrics that, you know, came from iOS client, solely looking at the metrics that came from the proxy, it might seem like you're talking about different things, right? You know, and if you're talking about this in aggregate, right, you could say, like, well, you know, P50 looks pretty good in both cases. P99 on the client side um, looks pretty slow, but you know I'm not seeing any sort of the same things on on looking at you know at P99 on on the server side. This is a specific request, right? So it's not talking about statistics. It's saying one measurement uh, that was taken on the client side, the same request, the measurement was taken on the server side, there's this huge disparity between those two things. And just seeing that actually save tons of time because now we can agree that actually looks like the network's the problem, right? It's not about server side latency. It's not about a measurement error. It's probably just, you know, maybe the request was big. Maybe this was a user on, you know, uh, they're still on a 3G network or something like that. And it's just, it's just gonna be slow, right? So, um, we talk sometimes about mean time to innocence, right? Like how long does it take for a team to prove that they're not the problem? Um, and that can be a significant drain on teams. Um, and this sort of evidence is really important for that. Um, speaking of kind of uh, teams and measurements, the, the last thing I wanna talk about was SLOs. Um, so just a quick refresher, if you're not familiar with SLOs. Um, so SLOs are sort of the middle of the service level sandwich uh, in my mind. So you start with service level indicators. That's what you measure. Um, it might be something like latency, uptime, or correctness. Um, from there, once you've determined what you measure, you can say what your target is. That's your service level objective or your SLO. Um, 
So that might be, again, 99.9% uptime or something about, you know, what latency you want to hit. Um, and these also have to be, you know, if you're a SLO uh, expert, you'll know that you also have to put some other time windows on these things to say whether or not you're meeting them. But finally, um, you can take that and then you can write a surface level agreement or an SLA. And that describes what happens when you, when you miss that target, right? And that usually has some sort of real world implications like refunds or cancellations or, or things like that. So um, focusing kind of in the middle here, SLOs this is the thing, like from a technical point of view, we can, um, we can measure and kind of um, grade ourselves by. Um, you know, of course you don't need tracing just to measure um, SLO, SLIs and SLOs. Like you can do that with lots of tools, but the key thing is here is there's really a couple of steps, right? So sure, you know, the first part is to measure those things. Um, so you know, you know, how well you're doing in terms of latency. Um, you can hold teams accountable for those things. But what we found, I mean, within LightStep, talking to our customers, talking to others in the community, um, there's a really important third step here, which is that you have to give them agency too, right? It's not just enough to say you need to make this goal. You have to give them the means to do that, right? Um, part of that agency is having the knowledge to do that effectively. Um, and really this accountability with agency, those are like the two parts of ownership in my mind. Um, and so, you know, we've found things like, you know, documentation to be really important in this so that teams feel like they understand. That's part of the, part of the deal. And this is where distributed tracing is, is, I think, critical is that, you know, it's the thing that's actually going to explain what's ch changed and it's going to help them prioritize their own work, right? So if they don't have the tools to fix the things that are actually broken, then, you know, holding them accountable to those goals is just not going to work. They're just going to get frustrated. Um, and, you know, engineering leadership is also going to get frustrated because we're not actually meeting our goals, right? Um, you know, of course, distributed tracing won't be relevant to all SLOs, but I think for things like latency errors, stuff like that, really critical, really critical to understanding those changes. So um, kind of to tie off thinking about use cases. So, you know, I talked about what distributed tracing is in some level. Um, the way I think of this is like, how do you know whether you're being successful with distributed tracing, right? And I would say it's not, again, just about deploying the software, um, about gathering the data, but are you really deriving value from that raw material, right? Like success means that you have dynamic dependency mapping. It means you have fast root cause analysis, actionable alerts. It means your teams are effective in communicating and they're using both sides of the story to you know, get to MTTI quickly. And it means that you have both accountability and agency to improve those SLOs. Okay, sounds great, right? Everybody wants this. Let's talk about how do we get that kind of thing. So um, instrumentation is, you know, a key part of that. I mean, there's, there's software that's going to um, collect and analyze that, but those parts actually are not so hard. I think the place where people get stuck a lot is actually generating the data to begin with. Um, and one thing that's kind of a tricky thing here and kind of maybe a, a warning is like, I think when a lot of people are looking at distributed tracing, you look at some, some demo, right? Right. And that's, that demo is designed to be the killer app for distributed tracing, right? It looks great. You can see all these connections. You can see all these services and how they relate. You can see what's slow. Um, but it's demos were made to look great, right? Um, and it took work to do that. Um, so I, I guess I just want to say, like, it doesn't need to look that good from day one. There's a lot of value that teams can get without doing that much work. So that's why I kind of want to tell you is like, when you're starting your tracing migration, in fact, I want to tell you it's not a migration. It's, it's a journey, right? It's not a thing that you're going to begin and end. Um, it's going to thing that's going to take time. It's not an all or nothing endeavor. Um, and so in thinking about this journey, what I encourage you to think about is how do you deliver incremental value for the organization? And then how do you inform the next steps of that journey? So it's going to be an iterative process, um, but making sure that at each point along the way, um, you're hitting some of these use cases that I talked about. And then let value to service owners be your, I guess, meta metric of success, right? So if service owners are getting value from tracing, then you're doing well. Um, and Quick aside, since I said value to service owners, um, this is sort of a shameless plug for some uh, uh, for some other stuff that I'm going to talk about, not in this presentation, but in, in future ones. Um, so, you know, in any and the reason behind this is really in any DevOps organization, any successful tool rollout is going to be driven by those individual teams, right? That that's why you have to provide value to those service owners. It's just not going to work top down. Um, so, I just wanted to call out a couple things that I'm going to talk about in kind of 
um, future chapters. Um, so first, you know, if you want to know more about how teams can get that value, I talked about these use cases at a pretty high level today, but I'll dive in deeper to how, you know, what, what is the data that you need? What are the step-by-step -step process to actually um, derive value in those use cases? And then secondly, you know, I, I mentioned service ownership a couple of times. I, I mentioned accountability and agency. Um, if you want to understand some concrete ways about how tracing can really support that, I'll also cover that. So anyway, stay tuned for those things. Um, uh, I'm pretty excited about it. I think uh, it's been really helpful to us at Lightstep in thinking about service ownership as, as we as an organization have grown. Um, and I'm, I'm excited to share that. So, okay, back to our regular program. Um, so again, it's a, it's a journey. Step one, start with customer critical experiences, right? So look at the edge, look about look at how your application is perceived by your users and get as close as you reasonably can. Um, that's often an API gateway or a proxy. Um, and in that, um, in that component of your application, think about mapping the incoming operations to those dependencies. And that'll really let you map out next steps and build this case for service owners to, to adopt tracing. Um, if you want to see more about this, there's a blog post uh, that we put out uh, a while back about how you can do that with just 50 lines of code. Step two is um, about, you know, once you've done that for, for one team, establishing a playbook, right? So what are the conventions that you wanna use in your organization around tags and, and, and events, things like that? And that really, this is answering questions like what matters for your business? What would explain failures in your application? Um, and then look at other frameworks, libraries, shared services, right? So this is like where you have shared code in your application. That's a great place um, for you to, um, to integrate tracing because that'll um, both accelerate the, the adoption, right? A lot of teams will get uh, the value pretty quickly and it'll also enforce a bunch of those conventions that I just talked about more programmatically. And then step three is really thinking about workflows, right? Again, this is about um, building understanding about improving communication. So where do engineers work today, right? Is it an ID, IDEs, testing frameworks? You know, what's your CI CD solution? Um, where do you have dashboards? Like where are developers and engineers looking today? and making sure that you're integrating the data and the value provided by distributed tracing into those places. I'm gonna say one true pitch here, which is if you're gonna do this instrumentation, use open telemetry. Um, open standards like open telemetry are a great way of, of making this investment in distributed tracing. Um, open telemetry is basically, you can think of it as like, a, it's a vendor neutral API and SDK um, for getting this data out of your app application. It also includes a bunch of other components like, um, like a collector, there's a Kubernetes operator for it. Um, and it integrates really well with, with service meshes like Istio. So it's a great way to bootstrap things. So if you want to know more, um, check out opentelemetry.io. Um, and like I said, this is a great way to, to really um, cash in on the investment that you're going to make here. But like I said, it doesn't have to be that you're instrumenting every service from day one, really like pick and choose the, the parts that matter. Okay, so kind of to sum up, um, uh, you know, so I've tried to kind of tell you a bit of story here and, and why uh, distributed tracing is, I think, so important. I mean, you know, I mean, obviously I spent a lot of time writing a book about it, but I wouldn't do that if I didn't think it was really critical to engineering and, and building software today. Um, again, start, you know, think about the key use cases for performance and reliability, right? Think about root cause analysis, about things like optimization. Consider how changes to your organization and your software have affected those, right? So what, what new needs do you have for those use cases that you didn't have before because you've adopted microservices? Um, and those could be either technical things like microservices, serverless, other cloud native technology, um, or it could be organizational changes, right? You've moved to a DevOps style of delivery. Um, that also has real implications for how to solve those use cases. Um, and then really what, if, you know, in one line, in what distributed tracing does is it puts that software behavior in context, right? It shows you what matters because like I said, there's going to be tons of things failing. There's going to be tons of things that are slow. Um, distributed tracing is, will help you prioritize that work and make sure that the work of the teams are doing is actually having real effect. So um, I just wanted to call out once if, uh, if you're interested in seeing what Lightstep can do to solve a lot of these problems, you can go to this URL here, go.lightstep.com slash request a demo. Um, there's a bunch of great resources on our website as well. I encourage you all to check those out. And yeah, thanks for your attention all. With that, I'm happy to open it up to QA. Great. Thank you, Spoons. And uh, just a quick reminder to our audience, if you do have any questions, uh, please submit, submit them either in the chat window 
or in the Q&A portion. Um, let's kick this off. So uh, first question here is some of the frameworks, for example, I learned that Istio, it supports injecting distributed tracing abilities into service mesh. How is that comparing to tracing, uh, to the tracing that we're talking about here? Great question. That's, that's one part of what we're talking about here. So um, like I mentioned, there's a lot of ways to, um, to get the data out of your application. One of those is to work with something like a service mesh or another framework. And what it's injecting is sort of a term of art um, among kind of distributed tracing aficionados, which is that in order to make distributed tracing work, you have to propagate some data that allows you to, to connect these pieces, right? Um, and so when you, when you flip the switch on Istio, what you're doing is you're generating a bunch of really useful data that can be, you know, sent to, I think, any, um, any distributed tracing system that supports open tracing or open telemetry. Um, and then, yeah, like you get to see that immediately. This is actually one of our uh, bigger customers at LightStep rolled things out through a service mesh like this. And it was amazing because we basically made one line code change we flipped the switch and then we had end-to-end -end visibility across their whole application. And it didn't go super deep into any service, but it was really useful as a first step because it let us see where that investment of going deeper was really gonna pay off. Great, thank you. Uh, next question is, how does Kubernetes make tracing easier to implement? That's a good question. It's a little bit tricky. Um, in some ways, um, you know, Kubernetes can help um, with, the kind of low level rollout of, of collecting the data. But like I was saying, you know, what Istio really brings to the table is that Istio understands um, it's operating at kind of the application layer. Um, and so it can really propagate the right data alongside the request as part of request metadata. Um, so with Kubernetes, it's a little bit tricky. Like in some ways, there's parts of Kubernetes where, you know, you can get some of this metadata becomes quite easy to use. Like I said, rolling out um, new, um, rolling out some of the tracing infrastructure can be a lot easier with Kubernetes, but it's a little bit of a, a double-edged sword in, in the way, right? Because it's created this complexity, but Kubernetes really only operates at the network level, right? So Kubernetes doesn't have anything that can observe individual requests and Kubernetes is not gonna modify a request as it's going over the wire. Um, so it's a little bit tricky for it to help in that sense. Thank you. Um, next question we have here is, how does distributed tracing fit in with the other pillars of observability, like metrics and logs? Yeah, um, so this is a question I get a lot. Um, so I, I like to think of, of metrics and, um, and logs and, and tracing not really, I mean, I think when, a lot of this comes from like this blog post that, that folks at Twitter posted um, years ago, which is like at Twitter, the, their particular solution to understanding what was happening in their distributed system was to roll out these three tools. Um, and, you know, like at Google, a bunch of like use cases built on top of those things. But really, those are just the data. Um, you don't have to roll them out in the same way that Twitter did. Um, the data is obviously useful. It's three pretty different data structures in a way, but they're, in some ways, they're also interchangeable, right? You can think of traces as kind of a specially structured log. Um, you can also actually derive traces from, um, from logs, right? Like if you have a correlation ID, you're using, I mean, that's what folks do with an elk stack, right? Is that you're sort of building a tracing system out of a logging system. So I guess I think of it, um, the relationship is really, yeah, it's like, those are all three important kinds of data, but I would kind of come way at it from the other end, which is like, what's the use case that you're trying to solve? Um, is it about, you know, improving median latency or, or improving costs for application as a whole? Or, you know, that's, going to drive you towards one sort of subset of that data? Is it about making, you know, on-call less stressful and making root cause analysis easier? That's going to drive you to using that data in a different way. So um, I guess I encourage folks to have all three kinds of data, but also don't think of them as three separate tools that you have to choose from. Think of it from the use case that you're trying to solve. Perfect. Thank you, Spoons. Um, that is it for our Q&A portion today. Um, I want to thank again the audience for joining us. And just a reminder that this presentation has been recorded and we will be sending the recording uh, to you soon. Um, and thank you Spoons for presenting today. Yeah, great. Thanks everyone for your attention. Hope to talk to you soon.